for this. Okay, um, yeah, uh, in today's session, uh, we are going to focus more on data and process modeling, uh, and especially in structured uh, analysis, uh, which is a, a popular traditional approach of, uh, you know, describing an information system for the development. And in this part, we are focusing on data and process model. As I already told you earlier, like data modeling, uh, you might have already discussed at uh, you know databases, for example, three levels of models, they are conceptual, logical, and physical data modeling, right? And 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 today we will focus more on process models, and uh, and then uh, there are alternative uh, you know modeling techniques like uh, object modeling, which is uh, used in object orientation, which we will cover in our next sessions, right? Okay, so let's look at uh, talking about uh, data and process model techniques. And the point is uh, we will use these different techniques, especially to uh, convey the development with different stakeholders, meaning different parties, because as the a system analysis or system analysis, uh, you should you know uh, communicate with multiple parties to get the uh, requirements collected and design system properly before the implementation. Now, uh, we should uh, when we create our different types of model, uh, we will have uh, what we call logical model which should support our business operations and meet the user needs. Like for example, if it is a university, we already talk about this, uh, providing education, uh, or research, and also like maybe, uh, you know, providing skills sets uh, on cutting edge technologies. So um, we'll focus on the main business operations, right? Now, there will be uh, several models when we talk about the uh, data and process models, especially logical models, uh, will sh we'll show what the system must do and we will hide any implementation details. Now, physical model uh, should describe how system will be you know, constructed. Now, for example, if I relate this to uh, you know, database development, logical models, we have uh, relation schemas and we have foreign keys and, you know, uh, primary keys. But when it comes to physical modeling, we will talk more on indexes, uh, storage engines, and so on. Now, focusing on data and process modeling, uh, different model, uh, you know, tools are there. Uh, main uh, technique, we discussed today is data flow diagram and our, our group work, which you are supposed to do at the end of today's session is also on data flow diagram. And there are other things as well, like data dictionary, which describe the, the data requirements as well as process descriptions. Right. Now let's uh, move on data flow diagrams. Uh, when we talk about the data flow diagram, it'll uh, a graphical uh, representation of the flow of the data. Now, since uh, we talk about the data, how data flows within your information system. Now, main parts are, we usually represent your inputs, the outputs, the processes where we will have within the system. Now, these data flow diagrams usually used in, uh, uh, in system analysis and design, uh, which is to understand how the data movements and any dependencies when you have different processes, right? So this will give you a clear uh, and concise view of uh, the system and system structure and its functionality, right? Okay, so I think um, we can now go into more details. The first thing that 
we need to understand is what are the symbols used in uh, representing data flow diagrams. And different notations are used if you're already familiar within uh, uh, your A level, sometimes these symbols might be slightly different. Don't worry because different, uh, you know, people use different notations and we should be able to family with any, uh, you know, representation. So in my case, I'm using a textbook uh, and there they talk about uh, different types of uh, symbol. Um, and mainly I'm using the first set of symbols. Um, in this particular case, we have processors, which is like a kind of a rectangle shape with rounded corners and put into two uh, divisions and process name will be inside. So the process means these are activities and these activities will change our data, meaning our transform our data, manipulate our data, or process it data, right? Uh, so uh, sometimes people use circles, sometimes you use, uh, you know, rounded rectangles. So in my, uh, you know, presentation today, I'm, I'm focusing on, I'm representing the processes as rounded rectangles. Okay, then the second important component, graphical component, the data flow, because this represents how data flows within different parts of the information system, within different processes. So these arrows indicate the directions, the movement from data from one process to another process. So this could be data between processes, could be data stores, and even it could be some external entities, right? Uh, external entities mean sometimes, let's say a customer or a student, those who are not part of uh, the information system. Third one we call data stores, which represents uh, uh, the places where we keep the data, we call data repositories, right? So for example, they could be databases, they could be files, or it could be uh, other storage mechanisms. So in this particular example, you see, we are storing data about students, right? Okay. Uh, and the last one is about external entities, the other parties, uh, or you can say uh, external sources. Uh, it could represent uh, other users, or other organizations within the system, right? So in this particular case, uh, we represent this using squares, right? Okay. Now, that is the first thing you need to understand, right? Are we clear about the symbols? Can you please uh, raise your hands if you understood this part properly? Any questions that you might have, you can type in the chat. Okay, I can be happy at least Kavindu understood that part. Okay, now that we discuss about the data flow diagram symbols, now the next one, we can talk about a little bit of some guidelines. Uh, so these guidelines uh, are, they are not actually fixed. People have different, uh, you know, representation. But as a as a person new to this, so this will be helpful. Now, the first thing we need to understand is when you are, uh, you know, drawing this data flow diagram, there are different levels. I will explain those later on. But for the time being, remember that there are different types of levels are there. The highest level is called context diagram, and it's sometimes called level zero DFT, level zero data flow diagram, right? And so on. Um, and uh, so different uh, way of representing this one. Uh, and 
if you take context diagram, usually we will limit our context diagram to one page, right? So that means we are trying to represent everything in the information system within a one page. And when you're drawing a context diagram, I told you that, that this is the highest level data flow diagram uh, and it will represent the entire system. So you have to use the name of the information system. For example, library information system, right? A student support system, hospital management system, you know, likewise you provide the name of the information system, right? it should represent everything. Now, for example, uh, we said the grading system, right? Now, that is what we have in, in usually in a context diagram. But when you go down in the other levels, like data flow diagrams, level one data flow diagram, level two data flow diagram, likewise, you can go into detail. Uh, we can say in commonly, they are lower level data flow diagrams. We can use a verb followed by a descriptive noun. For example, the previous one, we have a grading system. Now, the next lower level, we can say, okay, established grade book, assigning grades, producing grade report, and so on. So you will have a verb with a noun. And you should use unique name within each symbols. You should use unique names, you should not use any duplicates. And sometimes you are putting some references or uh, numbers. Uh, I told you like uh, we have what? Uh, some round rectangle, we separated these two. And usually with the top part, you can put some numbers. If it is a context number, usually we put zero. And if it is the, uh, the level one, then we can say one, two, three, and so on. And if you go down in that level, we can say 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. So you can put into details. Right. Okay, so let's start with the, the context diagram. So any problem given to you, you should start with the highest level, which is what we call context diagram. And it should shows you uh, the system boundaries and the scope, right? So how do you start? The first step is you create the context diagram, putting a one process. And we know one process is a rounded rectangle. We put in the center of the page. And then we make it as the process zero. And then, you identify any other entities. So usually these other entities, you put in the perimeter of the page, which means they will cover up, right? So the, the main uh, process, around the main process, you are going to keep all the, the processes. And then you will have data flows. You can put lines, which shows you the direction of the data flow. Remember that, this context diagram, we don't have any storage, right? Earlier we discussed, we will have some places to store data like data stores. In context diagram, we will not have this. Actually, we are using only three symbols when you're using context diagram. Right. Now, let me show you an example and to show you like how we can create uh, context diagram. So the example we are going to look at is called uh, grading system. So we start with the rounded rectangle and we type the system name and put zero, right? So grading system that the instructors use to assign final grade based on the scores that students receive during the exam, so during the term. So that's the starting point. So this is the software system that we are going to build. Now the other parties who interact with this, we can create. And in according to this one, what you see here is some external 
entities, which means different users who interact with the system. So you can see here, we have uh, another system, the student record system, because it's another system. You can get the student details from here. So because of that, this is considered as a external entity uh, and it will be another system. And then there are students and there are some instructors. Right, now, first part we have done, we identify this as the main one and put the name and the other ones are around this. Right, now here are the, uh, the lines and also here it will show you like information flow. Right, information flow. So you can see here, the information is flow, right? And how it actually, you know, get. Now let's look at, try to understand these lines and how the data processes are here. Um, the Malis asks what zero means, that the starting value. So that, that just a symbol, right? Um, as you can see here, uh, this zero represents the entire system. So usually in some places you don't see this zero, but if you're putting zero, that means we are representing the whole system. And within the system, when you want to represent, you will see later on, we will have like uh, values like one, two, three. And then if you go down in more detail, you will have 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 and so on. So, but uh, for the context diagram, we will have only zero, right? Which indicates the whole system. Malita, I guess uh, you got the answer. Right, okay. Now let me explain what happens here now. Um, now earlier we had the grading system, that is the, the software that uh, we will have. And then we have some external entities, which means uh, users and other systems. We have a student instructor and also the student report system. Now you can see here, now usually what happens in the grading system, it will start with submitting, students submitting work for the grading systems, right? And then we will uh, do this. Uh, we will get an instructors usually involved in the grading. And then uh, for this, we also need uh, the class of students. So that information we take from student record system. And then instructor is the person who actually decide on how to create the, uh, the submitted work, which we call grading parameters. You can see he input this one. And then uh, using the system, you can actually uh, grade the report. And graded work will be, uh, you know, can be sent to students. And once you finalize everything, the final grades are recorded again within the uh, student record system. So you can see that. Right, so information flow is uh, here using the arrows and the direction is very, very important. Now, there's another thing that I want to discuss, right? The first one is uh, whenever you draw some lines, you have to be very careful because the, you cannot draw, uh, you know, any way you want, there's a meaning. Now, when you talk about the system, you can see there are some inputs to the system. Some arrows come inside and some arrows going outside. So that means processing happens within this, isn't it? You have an input and then you have output, right? So usually when we have processors like this, you have to have an input and you have to have an output as well, right? 
So uh, let me share my book, review of book, just to show you like uh, some information on, uh, you know, uh, accepted, uh, you know, uh, data flows. Now in this book, uh, this is uh, page number 145. And in 145, you can see here that uh, some processes are here. So create invoice is a process and then there will be input and output. Because to process something, you have to have input and output. This is okay. And similarly, grade student work, submitted work, graded work, student grade. So these are the input and then we have multiple output. Sometimes we can have multiple inputs like hours work, pay rate, and we can calculate the gross pay and you can output this. And there could be a sequence of processes like here we get the order, verify the order, accepted order, you know. So these are like a correct combination of the data flows. But sometimes there could be errors as well and you have to be very careful. Now, for example, you cannot have a process where the data flow go from outside. Now, in this particular case, there's no input, but you know, outputs. No, it's not possible. Without any input, you cannot have output. Similarly, you cannot have only input. So here we have inputs only, no output. No, it's not possible. In a process, you have to have input and output, right? And sometimes incorrect input. Now, for example, date of birth, by giving a date of birth, you cannot calculate the grade, right? So this is not, you know, uh, unable to, uh, you know, so the input should be relevant to our work. Right. Okay, so that's about the processes. So let's go back to the, the slides again. By the way, any questions on this one, Ms. Diagram? Is it clear again, or do you want me to explain one more time? Right. So let me explain one more time. So today's session, as I told you earlier in the beginning, we talk about data flow diagrams. In data flow diagram, we re, uh, represent how data flows within the, the system that you are going to develop. And, and data flow diagram, there are different levels. The highest level is known as context diagram. So in this figure, what you see is a context diagram uh, for grading system. And Context diagram usually we draw in a single page and the process, the, the system will be placed in the middle using rounded rectangles and putting zero, which indicates the entire system and with the name of the system. And then around this, we will keep uh, other systems as well as other users we call external entities. Then we place data flows. So remember this is a system, so there should be inputs and there should be output as well, right? Some comes in, some goes out. In this one, what happens, uh, we, uh, the system first get the class roster, and then instructor will decide on how to create the assignment. When student actually submit the assignment and the instructor will grade the reports and the graded work can be accessed by the student. And once you finish all the uh, grading, all the students, final grades are submitted to the student record system. Right. Okay, let's move on. Now let's look at another example. Again, this example is from the book. Now in this uh, one, it represent order system. Um, 
which use to enter the orders and apply payments again customer balance right okay so to represent the order system uh, there are a few things that i want to represent so this is the context diagram of the order system so the rectangle rounded rectangle is in the middle which indicates the order system information system and there are some external parties. We have customers, we have warehouse, customer who performs the order. Uh, the warehouse is an entity where you know people keep uh, you know all the goods. And then the for the payments, we will have uh, sales rep, bank, and accounting. Again, another external entities. Now, what happens here? how it works usually customer place an order once the customer place an order uh, you know system can check whether the items are available right and then uh, if everything is uh, uh, no issue like for example when customers have uh, enough credit uh, you know they you can proceed let's say you don't have this uh, you know uh, equipment for the order then maybe you can reject so that's why you see another arrow in this side after placing order there could be a order reject notice now uh, if let's say we have everything within the system then we can place an invoice that means we will uh, give the equipment cost so that you can the customer can pay so when the customer makes the payment then order system can put the picking list to data warehouse and then you will get the complete order once you have the complete order right now we have the payment the payment will be deposited in three places usually those who involve in the sales they get a commission and within the bank you put a bank deposit and in accounting you will have cash receipts uh, entry so you can see in this example also how the context diagram look like right so before we continue i would like to have a small work right uh, right now the second one is uh, we are going to draw a level one uh, uh, data flow diagram sometimes we say diagram zero dft that means it's a lower level of context diagram and what we are going to do is we are going to show more details now earlier in context diagram we had only the main information system but we didn't have any details so if when we want to show more detail then we use data flow diagrams right so this will show you major processes data flows as well as data stores like uh, you know places where we can store the data because in in previous context diagram we don't have any data stores right and then this diagram repeats all the entities and data flows appeared in the context diagram. Remember that it should provide everything plus whatever already existing. Right. Now, just to get an idea like how we go into details. So now here, look at like we have. Uh, data uh, flows uh, for example let's say this is a process and then input is a the output is b so now when you want to go into more details right it will be within this one there could be a many you know entities many uh, you know processes within this and you know you can expand still the input is A, output is B. Within that, there could be many. Similarly, you can go into more details. Again, you can refine more. So for example, here we go for F4. 
you can then go for the details like F41, F42, F43, F45. So in this particular case, you see there are two inputs, X and Y, the output is Y, Z. So similarly, here also the input is X and Y, the output is Z. So this is how we go into detail. So let's see this with an, some examples, right? Now, this is our first example. We, are, we had a grading system. We had students, the external entities, student record system, and the instructor. Now, when you want to go one level down, right? So we are going to look at more details about this system, grading system. So let's see how it look like. Now you can see here, now earlier we had only one process, the whole system. Now there are four processors. There are four processors. Can you see the four processors here? External entities are the same. Student record system, instructor, student. They all are the same, no change. But this has actually break into four you know, processes. So the first is known as establishing the grade book. You create the grade book. Then the second one, you assign in the final grade. Then third one, grade the student work. And fourth one, the producing the grade report. So these are the four sub processes within this grading system. So let's uh, closely see how data flow works. So remember that there's a class roster, you know, taken by the information system. And now you can see the class roster actually is the input to our established grade book process. At the same time, you can see the grading parameters, sorry. Sorry, uh, grading parameters taken from the student uh, instructor. So grading parameters also taken when you establish me. And then, then it will uh, record the grade book in grade book, uh, you know, data store. Right. And then you can see what happens next. So the grading details you take from the second process and it will assign final grades. It will go back to the student record system. At the same time, it will record in the grade book itself. Third one, when students submitted the work, right, and student grade student work, graded work will go back to the student and student final grade is recorded in the grade book data store. Finally, we need to produce grade report. We get the class details from here and then it will create the, you know, grade report. So what you see here is going into more detail starting from a single information system, right? Again, it's very important that, you know, when you are working with the process, there should be input and there should be output, right? Now, uh, since we have data stores, I would like to discuss, you know, possible patterns, what is allowable and what is not allowed when we talk about the data stores. So remember that we discussed about processors earlier, right? Now let me share from the book, right? What is possible or what is allowed when you have a data store? So remember that when we have a data store, it could be a database, it could be a file, right? So the data should come from a process. So we, here we have post payment, customer payment information, we put it into a data store. And then 
that could be an input to another store. Right? This is okay. Second one, you can see again when you have create invoice, invoice information is stored in accounts receivable. And here there's another process which takes the in as well as out, invoice detail and payment detail. And sometimes the same thing could happen with uh, you get the input from admit patient admission form, details are recorded, and symptoms is going to another process. The treatment information is also recorded in the data store. So look at carefully. So when you work with the data store, there should be a place it will get the data in and data out. So these are like valid, valid relationships. But sometimes there are some cases. Remember, you cannot have a data flow between two data stores from file to another file. No, without involvement of process, you cannot do this. So this is wrong. Remember, there is no data flow between data stores. Then again, there is no place where you only get data store, the process will not store. There should be an in and out. Similarly, they are, could not have just out, right? Remember that there should be a incoming and outgoing data flows if you're using a data store, right? Very important. Then, with the external entities. Now remember, there could be a place where external entities, there are data flows, right? There could be input from the external entity, there could be uh, output, right? Or there could be a both input and output, right? So you can have both input and output, this is possible. but this is not correct, right? There should not have any data flows among external entities. I think uh, this I have observed in the very first one. Uh, so make sure that there should not be any data flows directly with external parties. It should go through a process. Then there should not have uh, data store directly from external party or there should not be have a direct outcome for external party. So these are incorrect. So be careful when you are creating information. Right. So correct and incorrect example for data flows. Process to process is possible. Process to external entity possible. Process to data store possible. External entity to external entity, it's not possible. External entity to data store, not possible. Data store to data store, not possible. So make sure that you follow these rules when you are creating data flow diagram. Okay, now let's go back. I'm going to go back to my slides again. Right, now what we were discussing is the grading information system. And what this is what we call context diagram, highest level. And in the lower level, what has happened? We have separated this into four different processes. And then this is how it look like. And there is a data store, which records some information. Right. Now let's look at the same thing for the order processing system, which we have seen earlier. So this is the context diagram of order system. And there are customer, warehouse, sales rep, bank, accounting. These are the external entities. Now, if you go down into detail of this diagram, you will notice there are three more processes which fill order, create invoice, and apply payment. Right? So when customer performs an order, right, it will check whether we will have uh, you know, items in the warehouse. If that is the case, you go to the next one. Otherwise, you put a message or the reject notice. 
Now, once you finish this part successfully, you go to the second one and then you will get the completed order and then create invoice should create an invoice and send it to the customer as well as it should store in a data store called accounts receivable. Then the third one will uh, store account receivables, payment details, and then invoice take details you will take, right? And then apply payment, you get the payment from the customer, commission goes to sales rep, bank deposit goes to bank, cash receipt entry goes to accounting. So you see a level one or DFT level zero a diagram. Right, now let's look at drawing lower level diagrams. Now, when you ask to go to lower level, right, you have to use either leveling or balancing. Now, what do you mean by leveling? Now, leveling is we draw a series of increasing in detail diagram. And finally, we might get uh, functional primitives. And then balancing input and output of the data flow align properly. The input and output data flows of parent data flow diagram are maintained on the child data flow diagram. So this is very, very important. And that is what we have discussed earlier with a small description. So here, for example, when you're putting, uh, put into details, if the input is A and output is B, even when you go into details, the input should be A and output should be B. So that is what we say about here. Right? Okay. So order. Right. Now, let's look at more details. Right? Now, we have discussed two examples, grading system. And then we go into uh, the first level or level zero data flow diagram. And then we'll go into details. You see here, right, uh, a more information on order. So I will go with order here. So for example, this is actually based on the order system. So we have to look at only this. So we have order system and we have three uh, processes when you go in one level down. And now you can see, right, the fill order broken into three parts, verify order, prepare reject notice and assemble order. So you can see what happens here. So the fill order, there will be an order and then we are picking list and then there's an order reject notice. So these three should be there, one input, two outputs. So there should be a one inputs. Yes, can you see one input? So one input and then two outputs. So you will have, <coughs> sorry. This is one input. And then you have to have the, the two outputs that we have seen earlier. Right, now in this particular case, if you go into details, what we see, we have customer and only the warehouse. Uh, customer place an order. And then uh, once you do that, you can actually get the credit status. And then you can decide whether to uh, accept or reject this. If it is a reject, then you prepare the reject notice and inform the customer. And then if uh, the order is accepted, then you send the picking list to the warehouse. Right? 
and that's what we have the very first one that means field loader now let's look at another one third one now third one is how to apply payment again you can see here we get the invoice details payment details and then there will be a the commission, bank deposit, and cash receipt entry. So if you look at in detail, so post payment, you get the payment details and store in account receivable, and you get the info, uh, invoice details, and store as a customer payment. And then for each bank accounting and sales step, we have to have three different processes. Deposit payment, you get the daily payment. Then three pointer prepare accounting entry. And then we have pay commission. Again, a more details within this. And you can see here now there are a couple of data stores as well. Right. Okay. So now that uh, we have discussed in the detail, so now I would like to have. Uh, small time, we will discuss on our group work. The remaining parts I will discuss later on. So let's go to the group work. And this is what you are supposed to do, right? So I want you to draw a context diagram and uh, uh, another level of detail, which represent an information system. So information system could be anything that now you are familiar with. You can propose any information system and you can think about the objectives of the system, right? It could be, uh, you know, look at, uh, don't use like what is already existing. Think about in detail about, uh, you know, some novel information system. I have seen people are using university systems, the library management system, it's not challenging. So think about a more challenging information system and for a particular organization, organization you can decide. It could be uh, in academia, it could be some other business domain, right? Okay, so I have already shared you all the slides, the materials are there, uh, but Remember, you should work as a group, right? So I, I'm going to put you in groups. At least you have to have three members, not more than that. And make sure that when you submit your work, uh, you should, uh, you know, uh, send the information about your uh, group members, right? So I'm keeping track of who's in the group. So make sure that you will not misuse that opportunity. Right, now having said that, let me put you in, uh, you know, breakout rooms. Right, today we have about uh, 96. So I'm going to create 32 rooms. <clears throat> 